This is courtesy of Taz.de, which I'm guessing is a German site. And unfortunately, I had to translate this to English because it's written in German. So I'm not too sure if it's going to be, you know, grammatically correct or it's going to make sense. But I want to talk about it anyway because it's an interesting topic. This is regarding the DJ called Mary Moxtemir, who has had a bit of a, I feel like a, a you know, a meteor meteoric rise. I'm sure she's been DJing for years, but I feel like in the last 18 months, maybe two years, she's kind of gone from being somewhat relatively unknown to being everywhere like and she's really good also not like she's shit she's fucking amazing but i've seen her play a couple of times now i'm opening into a place i think i saw her playing fabric once and a few other places and i really like her style I really like her sound and everything and she plays vinyl for sometimes and she just got a very you know very eclectic kind of range very good groove i'd, I'd, I'd say if you want if you want to categorize it in a genre which i fucking hate it's probably in the realm of techno but it can be everything far-reaching over that but i feel like she's kind of come out of nowhere but she wrote this article courtesy of taz.de that maybe kind of speaks to her kind of come up and whatever's coming through because i'm sure as most DJs will know there is no coming out of nowhere everyone's kind of been working slogging away like i have in pubs and bars for 10 plus years without no one recognizing it, and then suddenly you blow up and everyone thinks it's, it's overnight it's never overnight so this article courtesy of taz.e i think speaks about it and i want to see what she has to say and hopefully it does make some sense here i'm going to read it to you the title is between harmony and sexism and obviously for, and it obviously features mary moxamir here at the top here djing let's read the article here and again like i said it's translated from german to english so bear with me if the grammar is a bit crazy it says the electronic music scene claims to have changed. Although male DJs still dominate the lineups, the proportion of flinter DJs behind the decks is increasing. Um, fl i.e. flinter means um, female, lesbian, intersex, non-binary and trans. And I've only learned that because of dance music. Again, dance music and electronic music and club culture have been my gateway and opening to all this sort of stuff. I think I was familiar with it anyway because I come from an arts background, you know, having flipping studied product design at Central St. Martins and stuff and been around with those things. So even though I come from a fairly rough part of town, I've been familiar with that scene of things because of the things I go out and experience in terms of club nights and stuff and just generally the kind of space I occupy I'm kind of aware of this stuff, but it's only recently that I kind of was familiar with the term flinter anyway. So big up all my flinter massive out there. It continues. Everywhere it said, women are now are also involved. But this motto is in danger of becoming an empty praise because the scene is far from making rooms equally safe for everyone. Establishing safe spaces is a maxim in our scene. Organizers strive to create what they consider to be safer spaces for individual development and safer celebrations. But how does it behave not only as a guest in a club, but also as a performing artist behind the stage? To what extent are structures within the club scene critically examined? Are the spaces really safe now? This is a common conversation i've heard spoken about and the the best description i've kind of got from it has been from like the kink scene because we've got like a new kind of popping scene here in london where there's this kink sort of scene made kind of famous by the now defunct crossbreed party and a few others where essentially they're like you know um sex clubs but like in a nightclub and they've kind of become very popular here and a lot of those people in that scene have basically said safe spaces don't exist we have to kind of try our best to control the environment, have people around, have, um, you know, safety awareness officers and whatever people who can kind of go to if you're feeling, you know, uncomfortable. But the idea of creating a safe space in nightlife is just not possible because intrinsically nightlife is going to attract some unsavory characters just by its nature. So it's very difficult to really, really create a place that's 100% safe. You can do something to help, you know, foster a good environment, but you're still going to meet a decade or two on the dance floor maybe more it's just the nature of the beast unfortunately so it continues um to this day there's there is little or no reporting on negative experiences of female dj and the associated uncomfortable truths and not even from those who would attribute a high degree of sensitivity to dealing with sexist structures with themselves so i think she's saying that there's not a lot of people reporting negative experiences of women i'm not sure if that's true there's loads of women that have come out in recent years and have taken down some very famous DJs, you know, Derek May being the, you know, the obvious one. So I think there are a lot of women who are feeling a little bit more confident and brave to come out and share their piece, especially people who work behind the scenes who maybe get, you know, who maybe get themselves or maybe are in awful positions and situations and they want to speak out about it but they feel a little bit intimidated because of the person how big they are and they don't want to put their career at risk but i feel like nowadays people are a little more comfortable doing it that's just my feeling i don't not sure if that's true it continues it says i've been a freelance artist for about two years so I guess her being a professional DJ and I've to work a side job. Um, and I've been regularly booked internationally as a DJ ever since. My passion for DJing began in Cologne. 
Five years later, I moved to Leipzig to study sociology. Since then, I've been in the electronic music scene and now working full time as a DJ and doing around 10 or 12 gigs a month in Germany and Europe beyond. I would love that. I would love that. That for me would be the perfect balance. I think personally, especially with the other things I have doing or I have going on that I would like to pursue, I think the perfect balance for me would be about five to eight gigs. Five to eight gigs a month for me would be perfect. And then on the side, I can continue doing the things that I'm doing because I feel like doing what these professional high-level guys are doing, like Mary Moxamia, like even the Solomon on his level, while you're paying you're playing 20 gigs a month is too crazy for me sometimes maybe 100 that that's too much but i feel like the five to eight you can refresh your tunes that you're going to play you can be freshened up to every gig you can come at it with a good attitude and i think you can live a life that i feel like can inform the dj set because i feel like a lot of these guys and girls DJs who hit a wall creatively a lot of it has to come from the idea that they're just always consumed with clubs they don't live a they don't get to go to a cinema they don't get to go for walks they don't go to go get to the park go to buy some flowers hang out with some friends and stuff that aren't part of it i'm not really i mean i'm not really too sure but anyway it continues after a long weekend of multiple gigs i'm usually grateful for the experience However, this feeling is usually mixed with anger and sadness. In my everyday life as an artist, I'm repeatedly exposed to discriminatory, sexist, and offensive acts. Wow. Okay, I want to. I'm, I'm curious to hear this because it must be weird. Because again, she's a very small white lady who I guess doesn't look like a conventional DJ to some people. So I'm guessing the the hurdles she's have to overcome. Yes, I'm a DJ. Yes, I know how to put the equipment. You don't need to help me with the cables. Yes, I'm okay with my de my my equipment. Like it must be always exhausting. So I'm I'm curious to hear about her experience actually having to interact with these people. Um, she says as follows: I have to put up with them not only in the club but also in the way there. When I'm standing alone on a train station and sexist comments about being about me are being shouted at me. Or when I'm in a ta or when the taxi driver tells me how good I look and that I could also model because my figure is so slim. Okay, that's when it gets. Th these are the things that you only have to you only get exposed to when women speak up because I feel like if you're a dude, there's never a time where you can that's ever gonna happen to you. No one's ever gonna say, "Hey, nice ass" to you when you're waiting for your train to go to a gig. No one's ever gonna compl compliment how flat your stomach is as you get into the flipping Uber on your way to fucking Burger. No one's gonna do that. But when it comes to a woman, imagine you put on your flipping best garments. You're gonna go stun. You're gonna go entertain. You're being an artist. You're doing your job, and then just for doing your job and looking the way that you do, you're kind of you know inviting some unsavory comments. And it reminds me of a little dillyance and little kind of tete a tete I had with this other DJ online where I spoke about something on a video and she got annoyed by it and just pissed me off because she tried to tell me to delete stuff, which I'm never doing. I do my content. I do it the way I want to do it. If you don't like it, turn off. But from her perspective, I remember her, no, my, my opinion on it, I think it was like this woman DJ who I was a big fan of who posted a picture of herself looking amazing and shit. And then there were some comments on the thing that were kind of a bit thirsty. I think she ripped back as a reply, something quite snarky and really funny, like, oh, keep your first to yourself. This isn't for you to kind of, you know, lick over or drool over. I'm just kind of posting a picture of myself because I felt cute. And then it reminded me of this other conversation that um, this other comedian had who's fat and stuff. And he was like, oh, he was talking about how funny it is because he, as part of his promotion, this comedian, to promote his dates, he will post these really funny pictures of himself, like lying naked in the bathtub, covered in beans or rice or whatever it may be. And he says that how when he does that, it's never seen as sexual. It's always seen as funny because he's a fat dude. But if a woman wants to do that who is attractive, it'll be seen as sexual and people wouldn't take them seriously and they'd say they're trying to sell their body in order to sell tickets and blah, 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 blah. So if it was like an interesting conversation and I spoke about it on the podcast. I thought it was an interesting point of view or like an interesting thing to kind of talk about. But clearly that woman didn't think so, who the, the female DJ. And she kind of saw it as like, oh, you're inviting people to comment on me and what I look like. It's like, bruh, like how you look is how you look. And it's only people on the internet that are saying words to you. If it's people in real life, fair enough, that's an issue. But people say shit on the internet all the time. If you don't like it, block, delete, limit your comments, whatever it may be. But it's not that big of a deal. But then you read this article, you're like, now I kind of get it. <laughs> you know, I kind of get where they're coming from. Because if you're day to day, just living and existing in the world, you're getting people constantly commenting on you, catcalling, all this sort of shit. And then you're going to go play a, at a party at a rave and you feel like you're in a quasi safe space because everyone around there gets it and gets what's going on. And then you're still getting kind of, um, what's that word called? You're getting fetishized and people are, you know, 
just looking at you for your body only and not thinking about your art and your flipping artistry and whatever it may be, it can get really exhausting. So I can kind of see that from that respect, especially for her, Mary Moxamia, being a DJ from Germany who I guess plays all over Germany. You're taking the train because you know, they have great trains over there that kind of, you know, you can get for cheap and you can go to your gigs. Imagine that day to day, how weird, scaring, harrowing that must be. Anyway, it continues. On Instagram, I get messages from older men Offering to be sugar daddies or promising money if I send them a special picture of myself. Jesus Christ, man. Honestly, the life of a woman that's fairly attractive on, on social media must be so interesting and so scary to see as a dude from the outside looking in. Like what it ha what it must be like, especially if you're in the entertainment industry where you have to post pictures of yourself. Because I think people, for some, I don't know why, there's some guys that I think just because someone's posting a picture of themselves looking cute, it's not an invitation for you to like, you know, I don't know, send them a picture of your dick or something. That's not how it works, but I don't know why people have that kind of, you know, thing in their head. It's just, you know, you feel good, you put the picture out, you might want to get some dopamine hits for people liking, leaving fire emojis, but that's where it should stop. But imagine day-to-day -day what that must be like, especially if you're a DJ. It continues, it says, the situation in which they come close to me, even touch me, and otherwise behave in abusive ways are increasing. Once a very well male DJ wrote to me asking for nude photos. Holy shit! I would love for her to expose who that is. I would love it. Please do, Mary Moxamir. This is, to be fair, she's being responsible and not saying the name. But I also think there's a responsibility with some people. If you're, if you're in, if you are, if you feel confident enough to do so, to out people that do this sort of shit and share names, especially if, like abusive people. Like you have to just so you can protect other people who may come across them further down the line. You, you, you kind of owe it to them and to yourself to kind of put their name out there just so people are aware. I understand there's possibility of being sued and shit and it can get a bit touchy and it can maybe ruin you and the relationships with you having an industry. But damn, bro, a famous DJ told her for male pictures. Oof. Um, it continues. Too often during a gig, a promoter or male DJ has kissed me somewhere without being asked. Are you insane? Imagine booking Mary Moxtomir to play at your venue. You love how she plays. Like, I've seen her play a couple of times. Listen to a few of her mixes. She's a fucking beast. You get her to play at your place. You negotiate a good fee. You want to make her feel welcomed. And then you decide to kiss her. Un unwelcome, uninvited kiss. Like, people are freaks. People are freaks. <laughs> I swear to God. Like, what? And then what? The male DJ, I'm guessing, is person playing maybe before. And you're swapping. Usually it's a fist bump, high five, or maybe just a heads up, whatever. Instead, you're kissing. And they only do that because she's a girl and she's attractive. If she wasn't attractive or a girl, they wouldn't do that. So that's when you know it's fucking, it's very specific sort of thing, which must be harrowing for women out there, man. God damn it. Like I said before, as, as amazing as it must be, I think, not amazing, as, as, um, as, um, no, it's not amazing, but there's definitely a side to DJing where if you're attractive and you're good at DJing, you for sure can make it way more way before i do right just being like a fucking you know ape of a black dude for sure you can make it before i do but when you do make it it definitely comes with its issues having to field nonsense dms nonsense requests uninvited fucking advances um you know leering eyes even just djing at gigs just imagine if you're super attractive and you just feel like everybody looking at you wants to fuck you <laughs> that could be fucking so weird to kind of process like you actually can feel it because i'm sure because it's, it's you know many dudes have probably known that before that women could just feel your desperation it kind of reeks off of you even if you don't intend it to be so imagine if you're playing somewhere you're sober you're enjoying yourself it's a third gig of the, of the week you're just you know going through the motions you you can clock the environment you can know you can spot who the freaks are you can see them even through the darkness even through the haze of the smoke and shit you can definitely see it so I'm sure there's some female DJs out there, women DJs that say, hey, you know what? I can definitely feel it. When I'm playing somewhere, I can feel the energy. I can feel if I'm in a room full of creeps. Like, <laughs> whew. Anyway, it continues. But I experienced some such negative experience before I even entered the club. I usually travel unaccompanied, often to cities that I don't know. I experienced a preliminary high point a few weeks ago at a gig in Gdansk, in which one encroaching situation followed the next. Jesus Christ. Um, already in the taxi, which the organizer had called in advance, I was harassed by an unknown passenger. I had to prove to him that I really was a DJ because he really wanted to hear a set from me. I said no several times. So what did they want? Did they want 
So did this guy in this taxi want her to like start mixing in the back or something? Fucking hell. Um, I said no several, this is like, it's like, um, this is like the equivalent of when I go to place places and I start playing straight techno and people expect me to play hip hop because I'm black. It must be the same for some women. Like you go to a venue, I'm the DJ. No, you're not. No, I'm the DJ. No, you're not. It's like, just because you're a hot girl, that must be so annoying. You have to get, you get your phone out, you prove it, or someone in line says, "No, that's the little." Oh, okay. Now that must be that must put you. That must be such a vibe killer. It's already a vibe killer when you go to a club and the security are extra excessive with the searches, or they ask you who do you know, or they try and make you answer quiz questions. It just you know kills your mood. Imagine if you're going to play, you're buzzed, you're ready to go, you've got some new tunes there, you're, you're eager to see what it's like on the inside because you've never been there, and then somebody's like, no, you're not playing there, you're not the DJ, you can't be a DJ. Of course you can't be a DJ, you're a woman, ha ha ha, you can't be a DJ. Fuck. Anyway, so behind, the, the, um, returning to the article, it says, I said, I said no several times. Yeah, to hear a set from me, I said no several times. I, and said I felt uncomfortable putting on a set of mine now. He kept pushing me until I finally told him to stop. He then switched to Polish and blurted out something about me to the driver, believing I wouldn't understand him. Okay, she understands Polish as well. So big up um, Mary Moksimir for being a, a bilingual queen or multilingual queen. Yeah, he insulted me as a whore for not doing his will. I called the promoter. I was grateful that I had a woman as a promoter that night, that that's not happened over and often. So she calls the promoter. She escapes. She thinks she's in the, in the, in, in the clear, but I'm guessing this story gets worse. Arriving at the club, I made a, my way through the crowd. A man tried to grab my chest, so grab her boob as she's walking through the crowd to go and DJ. All the guys there probably know her as a DJ also. Honestly, man, can you imagine what some of these other women have to go through? If Mary Moxamia is getting this, can you imagine what some of the other ones that kind of lean into their sex appeal get? Because get? I'm sure they lean into it as a selling point and to get gigs, and usually if you try it, they're going to fucking shoot you down or they're going to tell you about themselves or they're going to kick you in the nuts. I'm sure of it. I'm sure. But, you know, some, some decide to lean into it, some don't. But can you imagine what the ones who do lean into it or do lean into their sexuality or their whatever it may be, you know, to sell tickets or just to be a, a performer, you, you do what you do. Imagine what their DMs are like. Imagine what they're like, what their experiences are like is in a club day to day. And this is why inherently it's impossible to create a safe space in a nightclub because nightclubs inherently attract pieces of shit because it's at the night. It's in night. This is what it is. That thing my mom used to say or my parents used to say all the time, nothing good happens after 9 p.m. is legitimately true. <laughs> Legit. A man tried to grab my chest and slapped his, I slapped his hand away backstage. I prepared myself and finally started my set. Imagine you get hassled in the back of a cab. You probably think you're on the brink of getting ripped or assaulted. You suddenly get out of it because you've got street smarts and you're exertive and you put your foot down. You finally ring the promoter as a woman. You get there. You're cool. <sighs> okay, I'm over it. Finally, so we can get going to set now. You're in the mood. You start, okay, let's get happy. Let's get in the mood. Let's get joyful. Let's try and provide a good set. You're walking through the set to get to the fucking DJ booth and someone tries to grab your fucking boob. Like, oh, God almighty. This goes to show that there's so many things that go into why sometimes DJs have bad performances in clubs outside of just, you know, playing badly. All these other things happen outside of that that we have no idea about. We're on the floor rolling. We're in the toilet sniffing. We have no idea what's going on behind before they even got there. Fucking hell. Anyway, it continues. I prepared myself. Um, I felt unsafe. Um, sorry. I prepared myself and finally started my sip. It felt uneasy when I saw a group of shirtless men up front pushing each other in the front row. I made eye contact with the people in the audience, a gesture in which I tried to give them my attention so that they feel seen. They in turn gave me a small sense of security in return by returning an eye contact. A few minutes later, a man from the crowd held up his cell phone and says, can I have your number? <laughs> okay. The picture this is honestly being <laughs> it sounds fucking horrible. Being a woman who DJs in in dance music must be fucking awful. Picture the scene. She makes eye contact with these guys that are shirtless in front of the booth because they're being a bit too aggressive and she also wants to kind of, you know, make them look, hey, don't worry about pushing and trying each other to get in front of me. I can see you. Like, well, go, hey, what's good, man? I'm, you know, little acknowledge, little head nod. They take that head nod. Or that acknowledgement as her saying, I want to fuck one of you. That's how fast the guy brain runs. It goes from, hi, hey, can we, f like, it's just like, relax. She's DJing. 
there's no thought in their mind about getting off each other. You're probably trying to think about playing the right song in, you know, beat matching. You know, making sure the mix isn't fucking clanging. Making sure you, you know what you're going to play next. Like, that's what you're thinking about. Maybe you're even thinking about your your meal after, but you're not thinking about you're going to fuck on the dance floor. Trust me, I played enough times. Like, that's what, no, that's what you're, if, as a guy, I'm not thinking that, and you think guys are usually more horny, women definitely aren't thinking that when they're DJing. So the fact that those guys thought that is legitimately batshit insane. And she responded by giving them a bit of finger wheels for the number. Honestly, man. The, the only thing you should be doing, typing on a phone and showing to a DJ is, I love you, you're amazing, or saying, please, can you give me the tune ID? And both of those things are still annoying, but those are the only acceptable things that you can show to a DJ when you get their phone, when you put the phone up up in front of them, or in front of the booth. Can I have your number? No. I love you. You're amazing. I'm so happy you're here. Welcome to Gadance, blah, 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 whatever. I love your tune that you released in 2017. Um, can I have tune ID? That's it. You should not be saying anything else. It continues. I left the club with mixed feelings. I bet you did. Knowing the guests on the dance floor could be exposed to more explicit and sometimes violent forms of sexism. After all, being on stage means taking a safe position and setting. At least in the moment, flint of people on the dance floor do not have this privilege. Yeah, okay. So she's saying that she felt safe behind the booth, but she felt bad for the people in the club that are on the dance floor because if this is what she's getting, being the DJ behind the booth, just imagine how a hiring must be on the dance floor. For sure. I can't imagine. I can't imagine the amount of times on the dance floor, people in the Flinter community or women in general, how often they get touched up. I would love someone to say that. Like a woman to be honest and say, hey, how often is it in your dance floor dancing that you feel someone touching your bum? Like how often? I bet it happens so often. And that's like a subtle form of fucking sexual harassment that <laughs> is happening on the daily, minute by minute, hour by hour fucking hell insane Talk, talking as a risk um this is not the first time that i've faced such situations i've had similar experiences in many clubs around the world but the public doesn't get all this because of course it's difficult to speak of the free rave culture in the same breath to justify any awareness existing grievances and inequalities once a problem is discussed an awareness team should be in the solution they should act as a constant as a, no, sorry. Um, oh, let's go. Uh, sorry, let's start again. Once the problem is discussed, an awareness team should be the solution. I agree. They should act as a contact person during a club night, but are they adequately trained? And the awareness team alone is not enough to make the club safe. Of course, the awareness team is like having street pastors and stuff for people that are like unhoused or homeless. It doesn't really, it's nice, but it doesn't do much. Um, if anything, it's more so a prior a prerogative of the club to inform or enforce certain practices certain protocols to weed out all the creepers that's the main thing like Bergen is a good example for the big club that it is i feel like again i'm not a woman so i wouldn't know but i feel like most likely if you're a single woman or a single person from the Flinter community it's probably the only club you feel safe at because of the high rejection rate they get rid of a lot of riffraff still some flow through or kind of slip through, I'm sure. But because of their, you know, entrance policy being so strict and because of all the mystery around the club and the fact that everyone kind of polices each other on the dance floor. I've always told a story about the first time I went to Berkheim ever. I didn't know that in Berlin in general, you're not meant to do drugs on the dance floor. You're meant to always go in the toilets. So I did what every other English person does, right? British English people, we're known to like do the drugs on the fucking dance floor. You're breaking the pill in your pocket. You're doing a bump on the dance floor quick and you're carrying on with your dance. But obviously over there, that's not what you do. You take your drugs like a gentleman and you go into the bathroom and you do what you want to do. If you want to shit, if you want to do drugs, you do it in there. And I remember specifically, I didn't even get a chance to take the bump. I took the baggie out of my flipping pocket and then some guy randomly, hey, no, 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 you don't do that here. You got to do it in the toilet. And that guy wasn't a worker for Berghain, just a random dude in there. I think he had butterfly wings on, stupid chill. I said, hey, nope, you don't do that here. Go to the bathroom. And that was just somebody policing people in the space themselves. So imagine if that kind of carries on, if somebody sees someone being uncomfortable or looking like they're being touched upon, I'm sure they're reported. So I think all of that is what makes those spaces safe, like everybody policing each other. I don't think you can have awareness officers that can spot things. It's not really, that's not really going to work. It's better to have like the training happening around people and be able to be like, hey, that's good, that's not cool, whatever it may be. I think so anyway. Going back to the article, talking about it, honesty is a risk for artists. The awareness safe space halo of social media and nightlife is blinding us so much so 
that we don't dare to take it off and give our opinion on such situations because do I want to make myself unpopular because as a female DJ I complain about negative experiences of my gigs very true um and i do not and i do want to be the one who disrupts the collective harmony because i point out the grievances instead of focusing on the positive thereby ignoring everything else so it sounds like there's a stigma against speaking out because you sound like you're complaining which is weird because it's one thing for a dj to be complaining about the flights they're taking and having to you know eat out of hotels and live out of a suitcase that's that's like you know first world problems to an extent but it's still sound understandable. You know, being in your own bed is being in your own bed and shitting your own toilet, shitting your own toilet. There's not, nothing can beat that. But surely complaining about your safety in a nightclub, especially when it comes to a sexual point of view and harassment, that shouldn't be looked at down upon as you complaining or you not being appreciative of your position. No way. Because just because you DJ, it shouldn't be a reason for you to be groped and shit. And just because you happen to be attractive and a woman, you shouldn't be the victim of that sort of thing also. That's awful. And so the the and so Halo continues says here to shine over club culture which like the rest of the world is still a subject to firmly anchored patriarchal structures and patterns of thought. When I talk to colleagues, they share their experiences. Added to this is their experiences, which are not always sexist in nature, but can also be inter intersectional and, for example, be mixed with experience of racism. Yeah, of course. Like I said before, like I've been to clubs where I've DJ places. You turn up with your stuff, and they're like, you you know, you're not the DJ. They don't believe you because of what you look like, or you go to a certain place and they expect you to play a certain and genre of music are oh, you gonna play afro beats are you gonna play i'm a piano and it kind of just makes you feel shitty really in general because i hold on just because i look the way that i look i can't play this music it's fucking annoying but um it continues they too are tired to talking about it they are tired of the effect as feminist and sexual spaces still have to be fought for many of us have an experience that we are not taken seriously and our experiences are played down the much vaulted vaunted safe spaces sorry then suddenly no longer seems to exist i definitely don't see the space it would be necessary to uh, so that we can talk to each other this space can only exist in, if male colleagues promoters and djs also position themselves clearly and rethink their actions and their own positions because their positioning should not always only be taken by those affected of course this is why i say it's a collective um of course she's kind of pointing out more so on the male side of things which i understand but it's a collective thing everyone's taking responsibility it starts from calling out the, the creeps and the abusers it comes from taking accountability and responsibility for those around you treating everybody in the rave in a space as your fellow raver brother and sister in arms looking after everyone you see somebody needs water you get them water um, somebody needs to call a taxi you call them a taxi no fucking intentions needed there somebody needs to get taken home you take them home without encroaching yourself on their space like all that sort of stuff is really necessary because that's the only way you kind of root out all the nonsense because if not it kind of continues and perpetuates and perpetuates sorry it continues uh discussions or professionally led workshops by anti-discrimination officers within clubs can support this process and inclusion clause in the rider for every artist could lead to a food for thought and subsequent changing measures promoters and club owners must constantly reflect on their own internal club structures because open spaces also need room to criticism of course but you have to start with calling out those djs whoever that dj was that fucking tried to kiss you behind a booth you have to call that out whoever that DJ person was or club that you felt unsafe out someone's grabbing your booby you have to call that all that things have to be made aware so that if there are solo ravers and you know women ravers out there who want to go around places they can know where to avoid hey if you go to Gdansk there's a particular club that you should be aware of because people do this and that and this promoter did this and that this, this is important also so we will we'll know who the monsters and things are um but i can understand from a career point of view she's only two years into her professional djing career the last thing you want to do is burn bridges if just talking about this is an issue like she's already saying it's kind of looked down upon to talk about this sort of stuff just talking about it imagine if you start naming names and you're only two years in you probably don't have you feel like you don't have enough clout yet you don't have enough of a name yet to weather the storm you don't know whose relationships you're going to affect it can be a bit sticky which is really sad to be completely honest but i completely understand where mary moxie is coming from but again check out if you haven't already um the original article a name i guess in german i can put up here on the screen it's like that I don't know what the fuck that word is. Jewishen Harmonie und Sexismus. Um, but it's available on taz.e. Um, I'll put the link obviously in the description if you want to read it yourself. It's a really, really good article and it does expound on some really interesting topics and she kind of describes it in a really interesting way in terms of how to deal with all that stuff going forward. So big up Mary Moximia.